It says fools die for the want of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 says fools despise wisdom. Uh, when P.T. Barnum came to this country many years ago, he said the American people want to be fooled and I'm here to fool them. He said a fool is born every minute. And uh, now synonyms that you can find for the word fool is stupid person, bonehead, blockhead, simpleton, chump, nitwit, goose, sap, numbskull, ignoramus, beetlehead, whatever you want. A uh, one who has been imposed on by others, a stooge, a gullible, or a dupe. Now, in the Bible, it may mean all of this, but it also has a moral meaning in the Bible and is a very important word in the Bible. And the verses seem almost paradoxical. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let him become a fool. And Proverbs 1.7 says, Fools despise wisdom. And God is speaking from the divine standpoint. In one passage, the fool is an unthinking, thoughtless, careless person without true understanding. In the other passage, the word fool is used from the standpoint of people who have received Christ because the world laughs at them and says they're foolish and ridiculous. They're fools. So there are unwise fools and there are wise fools. Now Jesus said, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. You be very careful how you call another person a fool. I wouldn't dare use that name for you or for anybody else. Never use the word fool in anger, the Bible says. But I'm telling you what God says about it in certain instances. First, there's the atheistic fool. It's repeated twice in Psalm 53.1 and Psalm 14.1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But in Hebrew, it actually means there is no God for me. In other words, the, this fool deliberately says there is no God for me. He's not saying there's no God. He's saying there's no God for me. Then there's the practical atheist. You see, there are many people that are really not atheists, but they are practical atheists in the sense that they live like an atheist. You profess to believe in God, but you don't live like you believe in God. You live as though there is no God. You too, in a sense, are an atheist. And there are hundreds here tonight like that. You believe in God with your mind. You may go to church, but you live as though God does not exist as far as you are concerned. And so you are an atheist in a sense. And then secondly, the Bible talks about the mocking fool, the mocking fool. Fools make a mock of sin, Proverbs 14, 9. Here is God in all of his holiness. And the Bible tells us that we've sinned against him. We've broken his laws. And we're under the sentence of death. We're under the sentence of death. I saw a film tonight on television on one of the news programs telling how many men and women are on death row in the United States right now. Under the sentence of death. All of us here tonight are under the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death, and we have all sinned and broken the laws of God. And so we're all sentenced to die. We are to die physically. The graveyards are full of, full of people that are there because sin caused death. And then sin also causes spiritual death. Your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead. Physically, you're alive, but your soul that lives inside your body is dead toward God. So you're a walking dead person under the sentence of death. And the only way that you can have that sentence lifted is to come to Christ by repentance of sin and faith in Him as your Lord and your Savior. If you would like that sentence lifted, if you would like your sins wiped out as though they had never existed, if you would like to be justified in the sight of God, pick up that telephone right now you that are watching by television. Pick it up and call the number that you see on your screen and a counselor will answer. And the counselor will talk to you about how you can come to know Christ. As many people here tonight, I hope and believe and pray, will find Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there are many people that make a mockery of sins. They mock God's standards. God's standards of sex. God's standards of marriage. God's standards concerning divorce and ethics and morality and social justice. We make a mockery of it. We laugh at it. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't ever doubt it. Your sin, your sin, 
will find you out, though no one on earth may discover it. You may never be caught. You may never have to pay for it here, as far as you can tell. But your sin will someday be found out. No one ever commits one sin that isn't found out. Everything that you did in the darkness, every evil thought that you ever had is going to be found out because it'll all be recorded. It's being recorded awaiting the judgment day. It's being recorded on tape machines far more sophisticated than anything we have. It's being recorded. Even your thoughts and your sins will find you out and it'll be exposed to the whole universe. Will find you out. Will. It's only a question of time. The word will is definite. Will find you out. Find. Perhaps you've deceived everyone else. Your wife, your family, your church, your friends. But the Bible says your sin will definitely find you out. A detective at last, after running away so long and hiding so long, God's hand will come on your shoulder and say, I have found you. You've been found out. We now know. And then thirdly, there's the slandering fool, the slandering fool. He that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. Passing along an evil story about others, maligning other people's character, wrecking their reputations by evil gossip. Gossiping is listed in the Bible as one of the worst of all sins. And yet how frequent that's done even in circles that call themselves Christians. It's a terrible sin in the sight of God and God says that person is a fool. You wouldn't think of killing a person with a gun or a knife. But then many times we assassinate a character or try to pull someone down or to get even or because of jealousy by whispering innuendos. Someone told me or he did thus and so. We commit murder by character assassination. Worse than killing a man with a pistol, a knife, or a club. He that others a slander, the scripture says, is a fool. And then fourthly, there's the Christian fool. The Christian fool. Remember the road to Emmaus after Jesus Christ had died on the cross for our sins and he'd been raised again? And remember he was appearing to the disciples in fact, 11 different appearances after his resurrection. And this is one of them. And these two disciples were on the way to Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. And they were mumbling and groaning among themselves. And another man joined them. And they didn't recognize who he was. And he talked to them. said, why are you so downcast? They said, oh... We thought he was to be the Messiah. Haven't you heard all the happenings in Jerusalem during the past week about this Jesus who did wonderful things? We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he'd come to save the world, but he didn't. He disappointed us. They killed him on a cross, and now the third day is past, and we heard rumors that he might be raised from the dead, but we don't accept that. And then Jesus said, Oh, fool. You're fools. Then he started expounding to them the scriptures from Moses through the prophets as to who he really was. And then he went to spend the evening with them and he was sitting at the meal in their home in Emmaus. And all of a sudden their eyes were open and they saw it was Jesus. In other words, the Christian fool who has the word of God in his hand, who reads his testimony, and yet doubts the promises of God. Jesus said, oh, you fools, for not believing the scriptures, that he was going to rise from the dead and someday he's coming back. And then, fifthly, there's the covetous fool. And the story is told in Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus told the story about a rich man in his barns. You remember he built his barns and he said he was going to retire because he'd made enough money now? probably going to go to Southern California, Florida, come here to Idaho to this beautiful place and retire. He'd made enough money. And he said, soul, take thine ease. Drink and be merry. 
And that night he had a heart attack. And when he was dying, there was a voice heard from heaven that said, Thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. And the scripture says, Jesus said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, he tried to find happiness in the wrong place, money. He ignored the power of influence in that no man liveth unto himself. He must have had a family. He disregarded death. He had made no provision for eternity. He had provision for his retirement. How many men and women I know who have planned for retirement, planned everything, but they haven't? prepared to die and they die shortly after they retire. It's amazing. I've thought about that. Some people announce their retirement, you read two or three weeks later that they dropped dead of a heart attack. They thought they were going to have five or 10 or 15 or 20 years that they could just take it easy and enjoy life. But it doesn't always work out that way. You better be sure that you have prepared to meet God. Every person who is more concerned about getting some of this world's goods and leaving out the preparation for eternity is a fool. Or the person who spends their time in social climbing or having pleasure more than eternal things is a fool in the sight of God. If you're not concerned about your home in heaven, you're not concerned about the riches that will never fail, not concerned about laying up treasure where moth and rust doth not corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal, then you're a fool. If you'd ask this man, what is your name? Well, he'd say, my name's the rich man. Or, I'm the prosperous man that you read about. Or, I'm an eminent man. Or, I'm a great man in the neighborhood. Or, I'm a famous man. My name is in the paper all the time. Then ask God, Lord, what is this man's name? And the answer comes back, fool. He's a fool. That's his name. The rich man knew every name but the right one. He had been called by his family name, his given name, his ranks, his titles, his wealth, the flatteries of men. But in the sight of God, his name was thou fool. That's all we know about him, that he was just a rich fool. They'd laid up treasures on earth but laid up nothing for heaven. And how many of us are in the same category? You may not be rich in the sense that this man was rich, but everybody in America is rich compared to Bangladesh and people that I've, where we've been in many places of the world, like in Africa, or as Victor was talking about in, in Vietnam, where he was a missionary for some years. Very few of you would stir if I would look out on this audience and say, fool, come here, I'd like to see you. How many of you would get up and come? <laughs> Very few, maybe nobody. But the Bible says, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Quickly, it can all end. Your dream house comes tumbling down. Trouble in the family. The wealth is gone. Here was a man, a multimillionaire perhaps, but standing a hand's breadth away from his own grave. Counting on everything in this life, the happiness, the joy that this life could give him, and he's called in the Bible by Jesus a fool. And then seventhly, there's another kind of a fool, or sixthly, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, but unto us which were saved, it is the power of God. What the world counts foolish, we have rested our eternal salvation on. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, turn your back on the pleasures and the sensual lust and things of this world, people think you're a fool. The world that does not know Christ looks foolish to me. Why can't they see? Why can't they understand? I want to grab everybody I see on the street and everybody we pass, everybody in the hotel, I want to grab them and say, look here, Christ could change your life. I see their empty faces and I, I see the, hear the hollow laughter. 
and I see them drinking, trying to drink their, themselves into some happiness or taking the drugs in that hollow stare that they had. And I say, oh, if I could only just shake them loose. But you see, only the Holy Spirit can do that. I cannot do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. The Holy Spirit must convict them of sin. He must also lift this veil that's over their minds. And so salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. If anyone desires wisdom, let him take his place in identification with Jesus Christ. What the world calls foolish, I'm resting my salvation on the cross of Christ, no matter what the world may think of him or of me. We are fools for Christ's sake, willing for the world to look at us as out of our minds, willing to be accounted as the very offscoring of the earth because we've turned to Christ. Are you one of the devil's fools? Are you willing to be a fool for Christ's sake? The Bible says in Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eye. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which road are you on? The narrow road that leads to eternal life or the broad road that leads to destruction? You have to make a choice. The scripture says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to continue to be a fool in the sight of God? Or are you going to become another kind of fool the Christ fool that the world will call a fool and call foolishness. Because you see, when you come to Christ, there's a price to pay. And one of the prices you pay is being misunderstood by some members of your family, some people in the community, some people where you work or where you go to school. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, come and take up the cross and follow me. You see, the cross that you bear, the cross that you bear is identification with Christ. It's not some special sickness that you get or some trouble you get. It's identifying with Christ and letting people laugh at you and being willing for them to make sport of you if necessary for following Christ. That's your cross. And if you're not willing to take that cross, you cannot be his follower, he said. Are you willing to take that cross? Are you willing to turn your life totally over to Christ? Some of us have got one foot in heaven and one foot in hell, as it were. One foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom of God. And we're straddling the fence. God does not allow fence straddlers. You cannot be a mugwomp. That's what a mugwomp is, a fence straddler. God, Christ does not allow that. He allows no neutrality. You can't not be both. You must come all out for him. And you'll find that all the way through the Bible. You'll find it all the way through the teachings of Jesus. A great crowd was following Jesus one day and he turned and talked to them about the fact that he was going to die on the cross and it said many followed him no more. Why? Because they couldn't take this talk of the cross. Do you want Christ in your heart? Pick up that telephone right now if you're watching by television. Talk to that counselor, make that call, and if, you, if it's a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening, all over the country. And you can talk to somebody and receive Christ into your heart tonight. Because you see, when Christ died on the cross, it says that the crowd down below, the mob below, ridiculed and laughed. And they said, what a fool. You saved others, but you cannot save yourself. <laughs> and Jesus was hanging there. And in heaven, 72,000 angels, 10 legions drew their swords, ready to come and rescue him. But he said, no, I love them. And when he died on the cross, he took your sins. Every sin that you've ever committed, he took on that cross. He took your death penalty for you. And because he was the son of God, and because he was sinless, he could bear your sins. And God has accepted his death as a sin offering for our sins. So that when God looks at me now, he doesn't see Billy Graham the sinner. I am a sinner. I have sinned, but I've placed my sins under the blood of Christ. 
and the blood that was shed on the cross washes my sins away symbolically in the sight of God so that when God looks at me he cannot see my sins and God has a unique ability that you don't have God can forget and it says that he forgets your sins in other words the tapes are erased from the time you were born till the time you die because if one sin ever remained on those tapes you'd never make it to heaven God is righteous and holy and before you can get into heaven you must be righteous too and the only way you can get any righteousness is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and he offers you that righteous clothing tonight free you don't have to pay for it but you have to do three things you must repent of your sins that means you're willing to change your way of life you're willing to change completely and put Christ first in your life from this moment on you may be a member of the church you may be a Catholic a Mormon Jewish Protestant whatever you are you need Christ and you want to make that commitment. I'm not asking you to join a church tonight, a specific church. I'm asking you to make sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're ready for heaven. First, repent. Second, receive him by faith into your heart. Faith means trust, total commitment. It means that he becomes the pilot of your plane or he becomes the driver of your car, of your life. You turn all the decision making over to him. And that's a wonderful thing. You trust him for your salvation. And then the third thing, you're willing to obey him. Study the scriptures and pray and obey him and do what he says and be his follower no matter what the cost. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen hundreds of people at each service do so far. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, I want to make that commitment. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know the sentence of death has been lifted. I want to know I'm going to heaven. Why do I ask you to come forward publicly? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, now is the, uh, the scripture says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise that there'll ever be a tomorrow for you. It's tonight. I believe there are hundreds of people here tonight that may never have this moment again in your whole life in which you're so close to the kingdom of God. Just get up and come. Fathers, mothers, young people, hundreds of you. You want Christ in your heart tonight. You want to make that commitment. You get up and come. Quickly. And as people are coming forward here at the Coliseum, you make that telephone call right now. The number is on your screen and counselors are standing by, ready to help you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that here in Boise, Idaho, many people are coming to make this commitment to Christ tonight. You can make that commitment right now where you are. You may be in a bar room. You may be in a nightclub. You may be in a hotel room. You may be in your living room or in your bedroom. Just say yes to Christ and let him come into your heart. As you can see, men and women and boys and girls from all over the Colosseum have come forward tonight to commit their heart and life to Jesus Christ. This is also a time of decision for many of you. Until then, this is Cliff Barrow speaking for Billy Graham and every member of the team saying goodbye and may God richly bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you and answer those questions. And remember, 
God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. There's only one way. Only From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning with verse 5. I hope you've brought your Bibles, because we want to talk about a very important subject today. The judgment of God, the love of God, and the coming again of Jesus Christ, and the end of the age. Not the end of the world, there's not going to be an end of the world. But there is going to be an end to the age in which we live that's dominated by the devil and dominated by evil. That will come to an end. And Christ the Messiah is going to come back. We want to talk about that a little bit today. The second chapter of Second Peter. Now, Second Peter in your Bibles comes right after First Peter, if you're having trouble finding it. Beginning with verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those who would live ungodly in the future. and deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and trials. If you're going through a serious temptation now or trial now, God knows how to deliver you if you'll turn to him and pray by faith and believe and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Those that are outside of Christ, those that live wicked lives are being reserved until the day of judgment. There is a judgment day coming. The biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah comes down to us today as an example of what could happen even in this decade or in the decades ahead if we don't turn to God. Now Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities and they were at the place that now the Dead Sea is in the Middle East. The Dead Sea is 10 miles by 50 mile inland lake in the Lord Jordan Valley. It's a mineral-saturated body of water which is 1,260 feet below sea level. It's the lowest part of the world. In Genesis 13, we read about Abraham. And Abraham is going through that part of the world with all of his flocks and all of his family, going to the land that God had promised him. He was a man of God. And he had his nephew with him by the name of Lot. And he saw that the servants of Lot and his servants were not getting along too well. So he said to Lot, Lot, let's divide. We've gotten too big. There are too many of us. Too many cattle. Your cattle and my cattle are getting mixed up. You choose wherever you want to live. If you want to go west toward what is now Palestine, 
or if you want to go across the Jordan and go to the Jordan Valley, which is lush like a Garden of Eden, you take a choice and I'll take the other way. So Lot looked all around and he looked down toward Sodom. He looked down toward Gomorrah and he saw that that was a very wealthy part of the world, a very wonderful part to live in. He consulted his wife. She said, by all means, we want to go to Sodom. She wanted to go where the good times were. And so Lot told Abraham, all right, Uncle Abraham, we're going to go. We've chosen to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and go down to the lush valley of the Jordan. And we'll take our cattle and our servants and our people and our family, and that's where we'll go. Abraham agreed, said, all right. The Dead Sea was surrounded in that time. It was no Dead Sea, of course. But at that time, it was a lush, unbelievably lush part of the world. But with their wealth came a lifestyle of hedonism, sexual obsession, and perversion, the like of which has hardly ever been equaled in the history of the world. So that today, the word Sodom is used to describe a certain lifestyle that people may adopt. As God has sent a flood to destroy a corrupted humanity in Noah's day, so upon Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent a totally destroying judgment of fire. And that fire of brimstone that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah not only destroyed it, but sank that part of the world to the lowest part of the earth. Now, what were the sins of Sodom? Why did God allow that judgment to fall? The first sin that they had was false security. They were secure. And we today have a security behind our oceans and behind our military power. President Yeltsin has stated that the whole world could be standing unknowingly on the edge of an abyss. And you saw in your papers this morning the problems they're having in Russia right now, in the government. We have a false security. Woe to them that go down to Egypt. Now, Egypt in that day did not have much to do with Israeli people. And yet, time after time, the Israelis would go down to Egypt for help. And he said, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots. But they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. Isaiah the prophet is speaking in the 31st chapter when he says that. They had false security. They thought they were absolutely secure. Nobody could ever take Sodom and Gomorrah. Then their second sin that the scripture mentions is pleasure. They live for pleasure. In Job 20, the fifth chapter, it says, The joy-making of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but a moment. You only have a moment to enjoy it. Then you have eternity to regret it. The scripture says there are pleasures in sin for a moment. Then it's all over. And then there's nothing but the remorse and the guilt. The scripture says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the scripture says, the heart is sorrowful and the end of mirth is heaviness. Even when you're laughing, many people. In Psalm 53, 1, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. But if you go back to the original language in Hebrew, here's what it says. The fool hath said in his heart, no to God. He's not saying there's no God. He's just saying no to God. You see, you can't prove scientifically that there is a God, and you can't prove scientifically there's no God. But everybody knows there must be a God. And then there's another sin that Sodom and Gomorrah committed. It was overindulgence. 
The majority of the world, a great part of the world, lives under what we call the poverty level. And in Luke 21 it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day comes upon you unaware. John Eastwood wrote some time ago, People do not decide to be drunkards or drunk addicts or prostitutes or murderers or thieves, but they pitch their tent towards Sodom and the powers of evil overcome them. And how many of us are like that? We pitch our tent towards Sodom. We sort of live half in Sodom and half with Abraham. We sort of enjoy Sodom. We long for the things that Sodom has. We'd like to have the fun and the pleasure we imagine that they're having. We'd like to have all that money. But the powers of evil will overcome you. And you will die before your time and be lost from God. In Jude, the 12th verse, it says... There are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. How many times we see charitable events and we thank God for those that are sincerely interested, but they go to have a big time and to be seen. And there's a spot in their charity. And that's the spot. And then the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had some new strange gods. Whenever a man seeks or honors or exalts anything more than God, that's idolatry. And there are many of us that are guilty of idolatry, but we don't realize it. In Psalm 44, it says, If we've forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hand to a strange God, shall not God search this out? Romans 1, it says, We've changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. We worship our bodies and we worship our good times and we spend more on our cosmetics than we do worshiping God and Christ. That's modern humanism. And then they were also guilty of greed Greed was a plague on the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the addictions that today has thousands of Americans in its vice is gambling. And part of the gambling motivation is greed. Workers throughout the industrialized world are becoming increasingly traumatized by overwork and their effort to earn more than their needs require. So we neglect our families to get more money so that we can, and we don't really need it. God has promised to supply all of our needs, but he's never promised to supply all of our greeds. And then, in the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, so bad that God gave them up. In Romans 1 it says that God just gave them up three times. He said he gave them up. Has God given you up? No, the very fact you're here today shows that God has not given you up. God is still speaking to you. There's still a chance for you to come to Christ. There's still an opportunity for you to receive the love of God and the gift of God in Christ. In 2 Timothy 3 it says, Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, Disobedient, unthankful, unholy. And anyone who believes in high morality today is laughed at. Jeremiah said that they had forgotten how to blush. And there's a lot of truth in that. Now God warned Sodom. He sent some angels to Abraham to tell Abraham what he was going to do. He was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And Abraham said, wait a minute, Lord. If I would find some real believers in Sodom, if I found 50 righteous men, would you spare it? And God said, yes. 
He couldn't find 50. So he said to the Lord, all right, Lord, what about if I found 40? Then after a while, he said 30, then 20. Finally, he said, if I find 10, Lord, would you spare them? And God said, yes, if you find 10 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare Sodom. But he couldn't find them. And that is a lesson to us, the importance of a dedicated minority. A minority of people who believe and who live it. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, says Isaiah 1, 9. To you Christians, Jesus gave a warning. He said, remember Lot's wife? The angels told you not to look back. If you did look back, you'd be turned to a pillar of salt. Well, she did look back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. That's an example for us today. Remember Lot's wife, one of the shortest verses in all the Bible. Don't look back. Many of us look longingly at the world, and many are like Demas, having forsaken Christ because of the love of this present world. Now, the climax of history is going to be judgment. The Bible warns that the world is in for a gigantic judgment. The only bright spot is the promised return of Jesus Christ. Because the scripture teaches from one end to the other that Christ is going to come back someday. He's going to set up his kingdom. And evil and the devil are going to be eliminated. And this is going to be heaven on earth when Jesus comes back. You see, Jesus Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross and died for us. He took all the hell and the, all the judgment on him at the cross. And the scripture says, God so loved the world. God so loved this present world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that includes you, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You say, well, when is Christ going to come back? Jesus said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We don't know the day. Don't, don't speculate. It's coming. It's sure. He left us certain signs. I wish we had time to go into all of them today. I believe that every one of those signs is being fulfilled right now. And Christ could come back at any time. Well, how will Christ come? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a glorious time that's going to be when Christ returns. The voice of the archangel. I'm looking forward to hearing that voice. I've never heard an archangel. And the trump of God, what trump that'll, trumpets that'll be. Now it'll also be a time of personal judgment when you, if you've really never received Christ, now you may be baptized and you may be confirmed and you may be a church member and all of that, that's wonderful. I'm thankful. But that's not enough. Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, all your religion is not enough. You must be born again. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you open your heart and surrender to him as Lord and Master and Savior, at that moment, your name is written in the book of life. And if my name were not written in that book of life, you'd never get me out of this stadium until I'd made sure it's been written there. Because only those who are written in the book of life are going to enter the kingdom of God. You see, for those who are written in the book of life, Jesus Christ died on the cross. 
They put nails in his hands and a spike through his side and a crown of thorns on his brow, and he suffered one of the most agonizing physical deaths that a person can suffer. But that wasn't his real suffering. The real suffering of Jesus Christ was when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, God took your sins and my sin and laid on Christ. He bore our sins. He went to hell for us. He took the judgment for us. So the cross is a judgment. What do you have to do? Repent of your sins. And you're not sure that you've repented? To surrender totally to Christ? Your heart, your mind, your body, your life, so that Christ is first in your life? I'm going to ask you to make that commitment this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen thousands of people do this past week. Get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. And you can get up and go back and join your friends. We're going to give you some literature, a book that will help you in your Christian life. But you get up and come. And don't delay. Because he says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You may never have another moment like this as long as you live. When will you ever see another thing like this in Pittsburgh? Maybe another generation or maybe never. And as far as you're concerned, it may never be. We're going to wait for you. You come from way up there, wherever you are. God is speaking to you. And back here, where the seats have filled in. You come and join them. This invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ. So can you, right where you are. Just call the phone number on your screen right now. Special friends want to help you with this important decision, so don't wait. Please call now. You that have been watching by television, here in this great Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, where three rivers come together right here, you have heard the message, and God has spoken to you, and we've seen hundreds of people come here, many more hundreds on the way. You can make your commitment to Christ where you are. You can say yes to Christ. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you and give you a new life. Let him come into your heart right now. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I do repent of my sins as best I know how. I'm not sure that I know how, but Lord, help me to repent. And help me to believe, Lord. I need your help even in the believing. And help me to follow you and serve you. He'll help you. If you make that commitment, call that number on the screen. Now we're going to wait for others that are still coming down the aisles. There's still time for you to make that important decision. Take a moment right now to call the number on your screen. Someone will pray with you and talk with you about your spiritual condition and the hope and forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. Call right now. This concludes our spring television series. We're so glad you joined us. Just before we leave you for this time, we want to remind you to pray for Billy Graham and the team as we prepare for special meetings in Cleveland, Ohio, and Atlanta, Georgia in the days ahead. Now for Billy Graham and the entire team, this is Cliff Barrow saying goodbye, and may God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, 
I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Bill.